Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Odin's movie blog. I am the critic who is a cynic. Hope we're doing well. And today, I'll be talking a little bit about The Mandalorian, which just finished today with its last episode of the first season, and a little bit of the update of the box office for The Rise of Skywalker, which is actually turning out to be very, very good for this week. And there's no bones about it. You know, I'll know I try and be as objective as I possibly can when I can. If I'm ever going to give my subjective opinion, I try and make that very clear. But we can also never ignore reality, which is the fact that it's made another $30 million dollars in the domestic marketplace and overall it's doing very well now how will it do this weekend there's still a giant question mark next to that but if the trend continues if the very minimal drop from day to day continues then it's likely going to have a very strong second weekend which means it's well on its way to a billion dollars at this point in time i would say there's only a five percent chance as of right now that the film will not reach a billion dollars i think it's very likely at this point 95 percent chance it reaches the billion dollar point some people may not like that, but based on the numbers we have coming in, that's what we have. I know a lot of people are trying to throw out there, conspiracy, conspiracy, they're buying tickets, they're buying tickets. Isn't this change different? Not really, when you understand just... Basically, they they perfectly chose when the film came out. They said, hey, there's no other films really in competition. You have Jumanji, uh, Jumanji 3, which is a great film, but it's in its second weekend, so that's not going to hold much of a competition for it. The only other films that came out were a bunch of Oscar bait films, which really weren't all going to be that you know much of a box office take in the first place, coming out with the biggest name on there being uh, Spies in the Skies with Mill Smith, and Will Smith has already had one terrible bond this year in Gemini Man, so once again, no real competition. So basically... They took advantage of the fact that there were no other films coming out at this time. They also came out just before Christmas and were able to have that Christmas break happen within this first week of release. And I think all of these things coming together is really what helped the film do really as well as it is. Now, could we see potentially a drop off in week two? We absolutely could. We could see a giant drop off this weekend. But the fact that we've had not just Christmas Day, but the day after Christmas where a lot of people are still going back to work, still very strong, about a 5% difference between the two days... I think is still pretty strong nonetheless, and we cannot ignore reality. But let me give my thoughts about The Mandalorian before I jump into any of the actual numbers that we have so far. The Mandalorian was actually a very, uh, I would say it's a good show. However, I wouldn't say it's a great show. Now, what do I mean by that? Some people might say, aren't you being just a little too cynical on this? Well, hey, you came to the right place. I am the critic who is a cynic. The reason why I'm not going to overly praise this show is because I think if we lived in a world that we were getting amazing Star Wars films, no controversy, no split fan base, this show would be, oh man, that, that's just a step behind. This isn't up to the Star Wars standard, but because we live in a world where we have films like The Last Jedi, where we have films like The Rise of Skywalker, then we look at the show and we say, oh my goodness, wait, Star Wars can actually be entertaining? Star Wars can actually be funny? Can actually uh, be compelling? There can actually be new characters that I, that I care about and I want to learn more about? What is this feeling? I haven't felt this feeling since 2015. Isn't it absolutely amazing? And I think that's where I currently am right now with the show. It's very good. It's very well made. But when you come down and break down each individual episode, and I think... It releasing weekly was both a good and a bad decision. It's good because it kept the hype up, it kept the interest levels up, and now Baby Yoda has become just this international phenomenon. However, at the same time, it allows us to take those really boring, obvious filler episodes, dissect them so much, and I think that because of that, and because they're so disjointed, you have three strong episodes. I mean, let's be honest for a second. There are three almost damn near perfect episodes. Episode three, the last episode directed by Deborah Chow. Interestingly enough, two episodes out of the three great episodes directed by Deborah Chow. And then this last episode directed by Taika Waititi. I think that when you break that down, you realize, okay, three great episodes and five episodes that aren't nearly as great, two of which are okay, which is the first and second episode. They were fine. They were introducing us to the characters, introducing us to the stories, and, and they were okay. Second episode obviously being way too short in like the 20-minute range, which I think pissed off a lot of people especially when you only have eight episodes in a season. But then you have a couple episodes that are just downright garbage tier. I mean, starting with the one directed by Bryce Dallas Howard, where it was just very obvious that she's not really honed her skills as a director. Yes, yeah, she might be related to one, and she might be a decent actress, I guess. I don't really have any issues with her as an actress, but it just seems to me that overall she she just didn't really bring anything to the table that was worth talking about. You know, Deborah Chow just blew things out of the park, and then all of a sudden we were left with two episodes, episodes four and five, you know, even and even six, really, where we were just, okay, we're, we're, we're going in this direction, and I don't really know where to go with it. Uh, you know, I guess episode six, you could argue, was, was okay because they had the whole dynamic with Bill Burr and all those other characters. 
But at the end of the day, it just, there was something missing. It just felt like there was something not quite right about it. And so you have, again, three strong episodes, a fourth episode that I would say is pretty good, episode six, two episodes that were basically just introducing, which were fine, but then two episodes that sucked. And so you see, because we have all of this back and forth of some episodes good, some episodes bad... I don't really feel like this is a show that I can really overly praise because of that reason. When you're only giving us eight episodes, and each episode, for the most part, is hovering around 30 minutes in length. This last episode, I think, was around 45. It really does make me realize that they are just trying to draw out a story that I don't think they fully fleshed out, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I think that what Jon Favreau has done with this show is nothing short of a miracle, when you compare it to what we've gotten from Kathleen Kennedy, Ryan Johnson, and J.J. Abrams in the real live-action Star Wars movies that we're getting theatrically, it's a miracle that they were able to actually work together and give us something competent with Kathleen Kennedy proving herself with The Last Jedi, or with Last Jedi and with Rise of Skywalker that she has no idea what the hell she's doing. But at the end of the day, I do want to stay objective with this as well. Just because this might be better on paper than the films we're getting, which it is. It's by leaps and bounds better than everything we're getting in the movies nowadays – it still isn't quite up to the standard that I think it should be at. When you have awesome characters played by Pedro Pascal, Carl Weathers, uh, Werner Herzog coming into the show as well. Also, I would say very underrated would be Gina Carano. I mean, not utilizing her strengths, the fact that she's an actual fighter. Uh, if you really want to see her go to work, look at a film called Haywire, where she does all of her own stunts. I assume she did all of her own stunts for this show, too. And it's just freaking awesome. Nick Nolte's in this show. The, the amount of star power that you have in this show, this show should be spectacular. This show should should be a 10 out of 10 easy recommend show and I find myself in the position where oh yeah guess what watch episodes three six seven and eight and then you'll love the show maybe watch episode one so you get an idea who the characters are maybe watch the first three episodes I guess but then you can skip these two filler episodes that really don't do a whole lot to progress the story and really are just poorly made poorly directed episodes overall so because of that reason I have to give the show overall for its first season I'm going to give it a C plus, to be perfectly honest. And some people might say that's a pretty harsh score. But when you take into account that there are three amazing episodes, one pretty decent episode, two opening episodes that are, you know, kind of middle of the road, and then just two garbage tier episodes, one of which is just completely awful. Uh, not episode four, but episode five, just completely god awful. I think that we have to be fair. I have to be fair. I have to be realistic. And even though in comparison, if my grade was just based on comparing this to the theatrical releases, this is an A plus show easily because if those, if that was the standard, if, if what we're getting in the movies is the standard by which we hold this to, then this is absolutely an A plus show. But because I'm holding this to the standard of the original Star Wars trilogy, Yes, the EU novels, even though they're not considered canon anymore because, you know, Lucasfilm's stupid. They just recently, uh, I was looking, uh, listening over to Lethal Lightning and Archaeopos Arche talk about this, that they've recently changed the timeline where no longer is it going to be referred to in events in the past before the Battle of Yavin. They've now changed that apparently in the canon. So they're doing all these things to destroy the canon, to destroy all these different things. And so we're left with this show and I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I, I look to all of those things that were in the canon, or rather that were at least in head canon for a lot of people. Again, a lot of those things were never officially part of the canon anyway in the EU, but George Lucas still allowed them to exist and allowed for people to almost create their own headcanon in a lot of ways, and it was great. And then Disney came in and said, nope, we're going to officially say this is not canon anymore, this is now Legends and all that other nonsense. But if we're going to compare it to those things, like the Thrawn trilogy, uh, like Outbound Flight, like really great novels, really great uh, Star Wars stories, then at that point, this show really does fall into that C-plus range. Do you agree with me on that? I, again, I think there's going to be a lot of disagreements. I think there's going to be a lot of people in the comment section saying, I can't believe you watched this show because you, you hate Disney, which I do. Again, the only reason why I even watched this show is because my wife made me get Disney+, Plus, and you could say I whipped all you want, but guess what? Happy wife, you will have happy life, and I will never, ever... Uh, not, not, not make sure that everything's going right here. You just take care of your own self. But at the same time, too, this is a show that, you know, brought up a lot of interest, and I wanted to talk about it. I like Jon Favreau. I like a lot of the people involved with this show, especially Dave Filoni. And it's really sad that Dave Filoni's episode really wasn't all that great in the first place. It's amazing that hit one of his episodes was actually one of the weakest episodes out there, uh, which is kind of amazing, the one that he both wrote and, and directed. But let me know your thoughts about that, because there's some people that are going to tag me because I watched it in the first place. Some that are going to tag me because I gave it too high of a score. Some are going to tag me because I gave it too low of a score. But I honestly think that my scores are 
are for the most part, you know, pretty fair. I mean, it's interesting that the top rated episodes literally are chapter eight, seven, and three. Those are the three best episodes by far. So let me know your thoughts about this and all the things we talked about in the comment section below. And just as a box office update, since I said that I was going to uh, mention, we do have the current updates, uh, the new updates for the Rise of Skywalker. So as you can see, uh, yesterday it made another 30, uh, $30.5 million, meaning the overall scale is up to $572 million. And if we go to my handy dandy Excel chart, uh, someone actually just taught me how to uh, freeze a column so that way the movie titles stay with you. But again, I don't know how to do that on my actual website page. So right now it's at negative $181 million, but it's still got a long ways to go. It still easily can make up that money. If anyone's asking how I got to that number, go check out the video I made a couple days ago where I break down my methodology of how I get to these numbers. So this includes both the budget, the marketing cost, the projected marketing cost, and projected budget at this point in time. And I'm updating these numbers daily as they come in. So this is as of today. There's some of these movies that haven't gotten box office updates yet. So if you see some of them and say, that's not accurate, um, we're going to go back to that. And again, I'll update it as the day goes by. What is interesting to me, though, is the highest grossing film, actually the most profitable film that I've been tracking to this point, by no surprise, is actually Joker, which, crazily enough, has made $553 million in net profit. So that's after you take out budget and marketing. $553 million in net gain, net profit. Greatest losses of the year, Gemini Man, Dark Fate. At this point in time, Bombshell is in the negative category. Uh, Spies in the Skies is in the negative category for now, but obviously that's probably going to change as we get closer to it. What is interesting to me, though, is the fact that Ford Ferrari is indeed at negative $30 million. But I talked about that beforehand. I think it's probably going to make that up. Um, when you look to the fact that it probably had deals with Coca-Cola and other companies like that, which can probably wipe away the, the gains it did not make at the actual box office because no one in the foreign market really was going to see this film, sadly. It actually broke $100 million here uh, domestically, which $100 million here domestically, which I think is pretty damn good. And what is also interesting is that Black Christmas is actually not a flop. It actually made a million dollars in profit. Don't let that go to your heads because it's still not a good movie. But anyway, let me know your thoughts about the box office, but also the Mandalorian. I know that I've been talking for a little while, but do you like the Mandalorian? Do you think that it's worthy of the high scores that it's getting? Again, breaking down each episode, yes. If I had to give scores, episode, you know, chapter eight, A, Reckoning, A, chapter three, A. If I had to give the other, you know, other uh, films or other episode scores, I honestly think that it would probably average out to be about a C plus because I'm not just grading each individual episode. I'm grading them all together as an entire show. And I just can't ignore the filler episodes when you have an eight season arc or rather an eight episode arc in a season. And some of these episodes are way too short. You cannot just waste our time. Especially if you're going to do the week-to-week -week release date. If I'm waiting a week and then I get 25 minutes of crap filler, what do you think that's going to make me and other people feel like? I mean, and I think a lot of people actually gave up on this show because of those two terrible filler episodes, especially since they came in succession to each other. But let me know your thoughts about that and everything we talked about in the comments section below. If you like this video, smash that like button. Give us a subscribe. It helps us a lot. Also, make sure you check out my website, ombreviews.home.blog. I've been talking about that a lot recently, but I've also been putting some more work into it. So there's now new rating forms for you to rate any movies. Once I get some more data, I'll be able to update the scores category. So right now, these are the current scores. Also on Twitter, if you've been following me, you see that I'm actually now trying to convert these numbers into actual uh, you know, letter grades themselves. The scale is actually right here and has been here for a long time, but I think that some people kind of want to know, is it a B movie? Is it a C movie? Is it a D movie? And currently at this time, Rise of Skywalker is at a D. Cats is at a D. Jumanji Next Level is at a C. And I've got some other films that have recently come out that I'm waiting for a little more data before I can put these scores up. Uh, but please, if you want to add to those scores, again, just go to the website, go to scores, click right here, and you'll see a bunch of forms pop up like this. Again, I've already filled out a bunch of them because I've seen a bunch. I haven't seen Uncut Gems yet, but this is a great example. Again, it gives you acting, editing, cinematography, screenwriting, directing, score, soundtrack, visual effects, costume, hair, makeup, sound design, production design. These are pretty, I would say, objective standards to a film. So you get to grade each and every one of those categories at an individual level. And then you can give your own subjective thought. Did you like the movie? There's films like, for example, Argo, where objectively it's a great film, but subjectively I didn't like it. So even though it might be an A or B in the objective category, in my own personal category, I would have given it a C. So you can, again, play around with this all you want. Do and, and come up with ideas. Email me. There's a request a movie. You can contact me to request if there's certain movies that you don't see on here. There's a little search function. 
where if a movie's not showing up, you can search for it. And as I said, this is not the best website yet. I know uh, it's all done, being done for free. Any ads you might see, I've ad blocker on right now. But if any ads you see, I don't get any money for that. So literally, this is all for you for free. I'm doing all the work for free right now because I'm trying to build something new. As we all know, Rotten Tomatoes is just a co total crap website at this point in time. They're easily bought and paid for by corporations. They will freeze scores. They will change scores like they did previously. And they will do anything really to try and help and hurt any movie that they really want to, especially in that critical consensus. This just gives you raw data. Any person can vote, any person can rate. And because it takes a little bit longer to actually rate the movie, I think that it's going to help you know, kind of do away with anyone that might try and troll the scores because it's going to be a lot harder. You're then going to have to basically create new IP addresses in order to score the film multiple times. And then even then you have to fill out the, the fill out the whole card every single time because you can't submit anything unless you fill out the entire card. And so I think it's just a better process overall. And it's again work in progress. It'll be improved as we go along. And I used to do movie surveys where I would do a uh, kind of a vote, and we did MCU films ranked. So number one was Avengers: Infinity War. This is before all the films had come out. The last place was actually Captain Marvel, right below Thor: The Dark World. Interestingly enough, DCU films ranked as well. So this was how many people voted in that one. So I might open those up again because uh, more people are starting to learn about this website. But again, just give me. Your feedback on it. I know it's not perfect. I know it's not pretty, uh, but it's what I got. And if you have any recommendations, please email me and let me know. Anyway, let me know your thoughts about this stuff and all things. Turn about in the comment section below. If you like this video, smash that like button, give me a subscribe. It helps me out a lot. You're all amazing and beautiful people. I am the fastest man talking on the YouTube today. Have a wonderful day, and as always, God bless.